Hurry up, get him inside. I'm trying, he's f***ing heavy. Why don't you help? Use your eyes, I'm holding this bitch up. Just hurry up before someone comes over here to take a piss or something. The voices filtered through the thick black cotton of unconsciousness, accompanied by the pain in my head where I'd been hit. Consciousness came slowly enough that I didn't open my eyes. I knew better in that moment than to signal my awareness of the situation. I felt my body being pulled by my legs and I made sure to stay limp. From the location of each voice, I could tell that Brett was the one pulling me into the auto shop while Hester was standing aside, watching and urging. I felt the surface under my back change from dirt to smooth concrete. The sound of shuffling feet followed me inside. It was Hester and the half-conscious woman he was with. The door closed and there was a click. Lights came on, faintly filtering through my eyelids. Let's get him strung up, Hester said. Put him under that lift. Now that I was on smooth concrete, the going was easier. Brett pulled me along the floor and then dropped my legs. Then he kicked me in the ribs. It took all I could not to scream out. Once I heard Brett walk away, I let my head fall to the side. I opened my eyes and I nearly screamed at what I saw. <gasps> there was a vehicle lift next to the one I was lying under. The lift was all the way up. Under normal circumstances, this would give enough room for the mechanic to stand under the vehicle and work on it. But there was no vehicle on the lift. There was a dead woman. She was naked, strung up with chains wrapped around the lift arms and worked around her chest. Her breasts had been cut off and her stomach sliced open. Her intestines snaked down to a plastic kiddie pool underneath her. Although I couldn't see into the pool from my angle on the floor, I knew it contained her blood and various organs. I thought about the possibility that they'd done something similar to my sister. And then I thought about what they would do to me if I didn't find a way out of here. But I had no idea what I would do, what I could do. There were two of them and one of them had a gun. I had nothing, but I had to think of something and quickly. I was still half asleep when I opened the door and stepped into the hallway. The door to my sister's room was open, which was not a good sign. Leaning against the door jam, I took a deep breath and listened. She was gone. She'd probably left soon after I passed out last night. Turning around, I moved back into my room at the back end of the trailer. It was cold inside. I didn't have enough money to pay for a propane tank refill, so there was no heat. But I didn't go back into my room for a sweater to pull over my t-shirt and ratty pajama bottoms. A bottle of whiskey with about two fingers left in the bottom sat on my nightstand. I swiped it up and took a long pull from it, <coughs> coughing when I was done. <coughs> then I dug under my mattress and found Emma's phone. She'd given it over last night and apparently knew that sneaking into my room to get it would have awoken me. Patting down the hall, I stopped at my sister's room and looked at the door jam. The cheap wood was splintered and cracked from where she'd forced the lock from the inside. I wondered what she had used. Then I saw the ornate metal hand mirror my mom had given Emma before she died. It was a family heirloom and the slim metal handle was now damaged. Honestly, I was kind of surprised Emma hadn't pawned it already. I certainly hadn't noticed it when I was cleaning out the room in preparation for her detox. I looked around the room briefly. There was a bucket to use as a bathroom. There was nothing in it. She hadn't been locked in the room long enough to use it. There were some dry snacks and several gallons of water, along with bottles of vitamins. The cheap flat screen television was from my room, along with the DVD player and the stack of DVDs. We had no internet, not since Emma had stolen all the cash from my wallet a week ago. She disappeared for two days after that, surely getting high with the piece of she called a boyfriend. But I couldn't be too hard on my sister. After all, her heroin addiction was my fault and you got right down to it. I'd been working on a small cattle farm down in the valley when I was thrown from a horse and shattered my right arm. This was back before the words opioid epidemic became a household phrase. I hadn't realized until later that we didn't really have doctors in my little Appalachian town. We had drug dealers who looked like doctors. So when I was prescribed OxyContin for the pain, I wasn't complaining. It helped after all. It did what it was supposed to do, but it also got its claws deep into me. 
When Emma hurt her neck in a car accident, I just knew she was in chronic pain and I offered her a couple of pills and then a couple of more when she asked. That was all it took. We were both off to the races, speeding toward the bottom of society like we couldn't wait to live in squalor. Our thoughts from waking in the morning to going to bed at night were all about how we could score our next fix. Of course, I lost my job at the cattle farm and with it, my insurance. No more Oxycontin, unless I wanted to pay out of pocket. And why would I do that when I could get heroin for a fraction of the price? Emma and I fed on each other's addiction. We were a team, in it together. We would split up to hustle up money, then come back together when we had enough to score. That was our existence for four years until I finally decided I'd had enough. I went through a week of hell and then a month of a slightly milder hell. Drinking helped, and I promised myself I would quit drinking, but that proved a little harder to do, especially since Emma was still using. She had agreed to quit with me, but she didn't follow through. I begged her to stay when she decided to go out and score, but nothing I said could convince her. It was something she had to really want. There was no forcing anyone to get off heroin short of throwing them in jail, and I wouldn't wish that on my own sister. Taking another swig from the bottle, I moved out to the living room. There was really nothing of value left in the house. Even my cheap flat screen TV wouldn't sell at the seediest pawn shop in town, given that one corner was cracked and the full picture didn't show up. Anyway, she'd left in the middle of the night. There had been no pawn shops open and she knew it. I figured she'd gone to her boyfriend's house to beg some drugs off him. And if that was the case, she'd probably still be there. Bottle in hand, I grabbed my cigarettes and stepped out the creaky front door of the trailer. The morning was hemmed in with fog that hung around the limp tree branches like poison gas. I plopped down in a wet lawn chair and lit a cigarette, adding the smoke to the heavy mist. My stomach was twisting in knots from all the drinking I'd done the night before and was still doing. I needed to eat something. I made a plan to get fast food on the way to find Emma. Then I forced my mind off the problems at hand and looked at my little slice of paradise. What little of it I could see in the fog anyway. The trailer sat on five acres of land given to Emma and me by our parents on their passing. Our mother died first of cancer and our father followed shortly after with a bullet to the head. Losing our mother had been hard enough, but when our father went out like he did, things got pretty dark. And that was another thing Oxycontin and heroin were good for. They didn't just help with the physical pain, they also helped with the emotional pain. It's a dangerous combination. Our father had been a year gone by the time I got hooked on Oxy, but losing a parent hurts for a hell of a lot longer than a year. I stamped out my cigarette in the mist soggy ashtray and went back inside to change clothes. I needed to find Emma, if only to make sure she was still alive and hadn't overdosed. I banged on the door while still chewing the last of my second McDonald's sausage burrito. There was movement inside, the sound of a glass bottle falling over and rolling across the floor. I banged some more. I'm coming, goddammit, a voice said. A wiry black man named Rodney opened the door, bleary-eyed and grumpy. The f*** do you want, Rick? I shoved past him and stepped into the house, ignoring his objections. I was much bigger than him, and he knew not to mess with me. Brett was another story altogether. Where's Emma? I asked. She ain't here, man, Rodney said, following behind me. And keep it down, Brett's sleeping. You seen her? I asked, looking into the living room. A couple of Brett's regular hangers-on were passed out on the ratty couches and recliners. Drug paraphernalia and alcohol bottles littered the coffee table. Emma? I shouted. Shh, Rodney said. Shut up, man. Emma, are you here? I started up the stairs as I heard a door open. Brett walked up to the head of the stairs, pistol in his hand. He was wearing only underwear, revealing a body swollen by too much junk food, booze, and drug use. If you had the money to spend on them, the heroin munchies could get you fat in no time. He pointed the gun at me, his broad and cruel face puffy with sleep. Where's my sister? I asked, not slowing or stopping. Not here, he said. Now off before I shoot you. 
I'd learned a long time ago that Brett was one of those guys who fed on weakness, so I didn't show my discomfort at having a pistol pointed at my face. Granted, the whiskey in my bloodstream helped, but I was uncomfortable. There was no telling what this drugged up would do. And it was the first time in our combative relationship that he'd ever pointed a gun directly at me. That alone told me something was up. When I got to the top of the stairs and managed a closer look at his face, I stopped. There were scratch marks on his left temple and cheek. My sister do that? I asked. Get out of my f***ing house, he said. Where is she? I asked. What happened? Brett pressed his lips together, eyes going hard. I thought of some of the things he'd made my sister do for drugs. Stories she'd told me when she was at her lowest, when she really wanted to get clean. Unable to help myself, I slapped the gun out of the way with one hand and grabbed him by the neck with the other, slamming him back into the wall. I know my sister came here last night, I said, choking him, hardly able to control myself. I knew how close I was to losing my sister, and I couldn't bear the thought. Even if I knew logically it was my own fault for giving her the oxys to begin with, I had every reason to want to kill Brett. I'd never killed anyone in my life, had never even come close, but whiskey made me mean and I had an awful feeling in my gut that something bad had happened to Emma. Tell me when you saw her, what happened? I let up on his neck and Brett sucked in a breath. <gasps> she was acting like a he said. We got in a fight. I refused to give her any dope. And then what? I asked. And then nothing. She left. Where did she go? How the f do I know? He was lying. At least I thought he was. There was movement from below and I looked down to see that several of the people from the living room were now standing next to Rodney at the bottom of the stairs. One guy with a shaved head had a switchblade out. Another guy appeared with a baseball bat. I yanked the gun out of Brett's hand and stepped back, quickly transferring the weapon to my right hand. Don't move, I said, before going down the hall and glancing into each of the three bedrooms. I saw a couple of strung out women, but no Emma. I moved back to the stairs and stopped at the top of them. Brett hadn't moved. He was rubbing his neck. After glaring at him briefly, I took a step down. That was when he spoke. Your sister is nasty, he said, barely above a whisper. I never met a bigger s You should hear some of the things I made her do. I stepped over and whipped the barrel of the gun into his face, right where the scratches were. Only I did it hard as hard as I could. The metal tore through the skin at his temple and continued down at an angle, smashing into his nose. He went down hard and immediately started screaming as blood poured out of the two separate gashes. The guys at the bottom of the stairs started up, but I pointed the gun at them. I didn't need to say anything. As I moved down the stairs, leading with the gun, Brett started screaming at me. You're dead! He shouted, voice cracking with pain and rage. You're dead, and so's your slut sister. I'm gonna cut your dick off and shut it in your goddamn mouth. I corralled all the others back into the living room and left the house backward through the front door. I didn't lower the weapon until I was in my truck and moving down the road. Once I could no longer see the house in my mirrors, I set the gun down on the bench seat beside me and gripped the wheel with both hands, knuckles going white. I punched the dash three times in quick succession as I yelled, cracking the sun-faded plastic. It was a stupid thing to do, maybe the stupidest. Brett was a proud man, and I knew I'd just made things worse for both myself and my sister. I didn't know if he would actually try to kill me, but I knew I'd crossed the line. There was no way he would let it go, no way. Now, finding Emma was even more important. I had to find her before he did. I quickly checked the other likely spots, of which there were few. The whole time, I was glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see Brett's car or Brett himself coming for me, but he didn't, not yet. He was probably at the hospital, getting his face sewn up. After checking the spots, I made calls. No one admitted to seeing Emma the night before. Several hours of searching passed before I admitted to myself that I had to go to the one place I really didn't want to go. It was also the one place Emma promised me she would never go to score. It took me 30 minutes to drive out to the property, and I chain-smoked the whole way. 
The fog had lifted, but a dreary gray sky remained low over the land, diffusing the sun and making it seem like half night. Wet leaves of yellow, red, and brown sat clumped at the sides of the road, half barren trees like rotting bone picked corpses everywhere I looked. The place had once been called Blackburn Industries, back when it was a fully functioning business. Now, everyone just called it The Burn. Julie and Paul Blackburn had been pillars of the community, operating several legitimate businesses on their 450-acre plot of land, which had been in the family for generations. After Paul Blackburn died in their automotive repair shop, when a lift jack failed, causing a car to fall on him, Julie gave the place over to their one and only son, Esther. After that, she moved to Arizona to be closer to her sister. Everyone but Julie Blackburn seemed to know what would happen once Hester took over, and he didn't disappoint. He ran the place into the ground and started selling off plots of land to fuel his party lifestyle. In the years Hester had been the owner of the property, increasingly strange stories filtered through town like blood seeping into the cracks of the earth. Everyone in town had heard about the raging parties Hester threw, many of them lasting days or sometimes even weeks. Nowadays, it was like one never-ending party on the burn. Even before he took over, everyone knew that Hester wasn't right in the head. I'd had several interactions with him over the years, and none of them had been good. Mostly, back in the days before he took over, I would spot him at the local bars. He was always getting into fights or getting tossed out of the bars. I heard he'd served several years in prison for attempted rape when he was 18. Although I was just a little kid when that happened and had no personal recollection of it, I figured it was true. He seemed like the type, which was why I made Emma promise not to ever go up there. And it wasn't just him I was worried about. He had long since developed an entourage of men and women almost as crazy as he was. Apparently, whenever they were gearing up for a party, they would drive the two hours to Pittsburgh and find as many cheap prostitutes as they could many of them struggling to stay off the streets and pay them in drugs. The way I heard it, if Hester liked them, he would let them stay at the property as kind of live-in sex slaves, doped to the gills 24-7. It didn't take a huge jump in logic to see that Emma was on the brink of that kind of life. So as I pulled up to the gate outside the burn, that bad feeling in my gut gave a hard twist. I hoped there was some other explanation that Emma hadn't gone there in her desperation to get right, as junkies called it. But that feeling in my gut told me otherwise. Leaving the truck running, I stepped out and approached the wrought iron gate. Beyond it, up the dirt driveway, I could see the two-story house and two large warehouses off to the side. There were vehicle parts littering the property, along with discarded barrels and random garbage. There was an electronic keypad to my left. I pressed the intercom button. Nothing happened for several moments, so I pressed it again. What? A man said through the speaker. I didn't recognize his voice. I'm looking for Emma Peterson, I said. My sister, have you seen her? No, the man said. I waited for more, but that was it. Hello? I said. Nothing. I hit the button again. The same voice came back on. off. Swallowing my anger, I took a moment to compose my voice. I had to be smart about this. If you don't mind, I'd just like to come and look around for her. She may have come to party last night. I just want to get her and leave. Is your sister an adult? I hesitated. Listen, I just want to find... I'm sure she's a f***ing adult, because we don't let no kids in here. And if she's an adult, and if she's here, she's here through her own free will. Now, if you don't f*** off, I'll be forced to make you leave. My composure broke, and I rushed up to the gate, grabbing the metal bars, trying to pull them open. They wouldn't budge, but I kept trying, my anger getting the better of me. The crack of a gunshot froze me. I looked down, half expecting to see blood pouring out of a bullet hole in my chest, but I was unharmed. Looking up through the gate, I could see a man on the front steps of the house. He had the rifle pointing at the sky, but he brought it down and pointed it at me lining his eye up behind the scope. I backed away from the gate and got into my truck, then reversed away from the property. As I went, I looked down at the pistol on the seat beside me. A seething anger sent hot blood coursing through me as I turned around and headed back to the trailer, hoping Emma would be there when I got back. 
she wasn't. I spent the afternoon calling anyone I thought might have seen Emma the previous night. Many of them I had already called that morning. None of them had any idea where Emma was. By the time the sun was down, I knew I had to get into the burn and look for her. This time, I didn't go to the front gate. I knew the area well, so I parked my truck on a little used dirt road near the back of the Blackburn property and climbed through the barbed wire fence. I walked through the woods and picked a spot to watch, waiting for the party to start. Around eight o'clock, I watched as about 15 people made their way over from the house. Emma wasn't among them. Shortly after they went into the warehouse, I heard music start up from inside. 15 people wasn't enough. I had to wait and hope that more people would show up so I could blend in with the crowd. I sat in the cold and dark for an hour before I saw three sets of headlights come up the road and stop briefly at the gate before continuing on. Two SUVs and a van pulled up in front of the house, out of my view. A few moments later, 19 people walked into the warehouse. Deciding now was the time, I moved down the hill into the back of the house. I wore my tan-colored ranch coat. The pistol I'd taken from Brett was inside the right front pocket. I got inside the house without issue because the back door was unlocked. The place was a pigsty. Fast food garbage, beer cans, and pizza boxes were everywhere. Dishes were piled up all around the sink. Rolling papers and meth pipes and syringes sat on every available table. I searched the place and found no one but a passed out woman. I had to check to make sure she was breathing before moving on. No sign of Emma. I went out the same way I'd come and headed toward the warehouse. As I moved toward the door, I saw another vehicle coming up the driveway. Hanging back, I waited until the people, six of them, exited the SUV and headed toward the warehouse, carrying bottles of booze and cases of beer. I didn't recognize any of them, so I thought it was safe to join them as they went inside. None of them even acknowledged me beyond a casual glance. I walked into thudding bass, swirling colored lights, and the excited voices of the partygoers. Aside from the lights, it was fairly dark in the warehouse, which had housed a hydroponic produce operation back before Hester had taken over. My parents had often bought fresh veggies at the local farmer's market from Mrs. Blackburn. But all that equipment was gone now, likely sold off by Hester, leaving a large dance floor in the middle. There was a stage at one side, two stripper poles jutting out of it. Nearby sat a kiddie pool that I figured was often used for female bikini wrestling or some other such nonsense. There were a couple of kegs and ice baths and some tables and chairs around the sides. I peered around the room, seeing no sign of Emma, but I spotted Hester Blackburn pretty quickly. He was on the opposite side of the space, sitting in a recliner with a wobbly woman in his lap. She could barely keep her eyes open as the gaunt-looking middle-aged man groped at her breasts with one hand through her black spaghetti strap shirt. Imagining my sister in her place, I had to quell an eruption of anger. It would do no good to go over there and assault him in front of everyone. I was here to find Emma, not to right all the wrongs that surely happened in this hell on earth. Moving among the people, I grabbed a red plastic cup and poured myself a beer, chatting occasionally with others to blend in. I didn't use my real name though, and I stayed away from Hester, afraid he would recognize me, but I kept my eye on him. The door to the warehouse opened. I glanced over, hoping to see Emma walk in, but instead, I saw Brett walk in, his face bandaged and bruised. I ducked down behind a couple of drunk homeless women, pretending I had to tie my shoe. From my kneel, I watched as Brett went over to Hester and whispered in the man's ear. The two conversed for the better part of two minutes before Brett stood again and moved into the crowd. Hester said something to the woman still in his lap. When she didn't respond fast enough, he shoved her off onto the hard floor, stood up, and slapped her. No one seemed to notice. If they did, they didn't seem to care. He yanked the woman up by her arms and the two of them walked toward another door at the back of the warehouse. Looking around, I could no longer see Brett. I stood up and walked across the warehouse, coming to the door Hester and the woman had just used. I stepped outside into the night, hearing talking from around the corner. I peered around, seeing that he and the woman were at the other warehouse, a garage which was used when the vehicle repair business had been in operation. 
Esther let loose a stream of curses at the woman, who was swaying on her feet, as he unlocked the door with two different keys for two different deadbolts. As he opened the door, I reached into my pocket for the pistol, knowing this was my chance. But before I could even get the gun out of my pocket, I heard a noise behind me. Something struck the side of my head. My legs turned to rubber and I tumbled down, vision blurring. The f***, Hester said, turning toward us. I told you he'd come here, Brett said from behind me. Well, s***, Hester said. Bring him here. We'll do them all at the same time. I tried to pull the gun out, but it seemed to be snagged in the pocket. Then Brett hit me again. Hurry up, get him inside. I'm trying, he's f***ing heavy, why don't you help? Use your eyes, I'm holding this bitch up. Just hurry up before someone comes over here to take a piss or something. The voices filtered through the thick black cotton of unconsciousness, accompanied by the pain in my head where Brett had hit me. Consciousness came slowly enough that I didn't open my eyes. I knew better in that moment than to signal my awareness of the situation. I felt my body being pulled by my legs, and I made sure to stay limp. I felt the surface under my back change from dirt to smooth concrete. The sound of shuffling feet followed me inside. Esther and the half-conscious woman. Knowing I had to wait for the right moment, I continued pretending to be unconscious. With two of them, I knew I wouldn't have much of a chance, especially since I knew one of them had the gun I'd taken from Brett earlier. I no longer felt its weight in my front right jacket pocket. The door closed and there was a click. Lights came on, faintly filtering through my eyelids. Let's get him strung up, Hester said. Put him under that lift. Now that I was on smooth concrete, the going was easier. Brett pulled me along the floor and then dropped my legs. Then he kicked me in the ribs. It took everything I had to not scream out. But if quitting dope had taught me one thing, it was to embrace the pain and discomfort. So I made no sound and no movement, not until I heard Brett walk away. I let my head fall to the side, away from the two men, and then opened my eyes. I nearly screamed at what I saw. <gasps> there was a vehicle lift next to the one I was lying under. The lift was all the way up. Under normal circumstances, this would give enough room for the mechanic to stand under the vehicle and work on it. But of course, there was no vehicle on the lift. There was a dead woman. She was naked, strung up with chains wrapped around the lift arms and worked around her chest. Her breasts had been cut off and her stomach sliced open. Her intestines snaked down to a plastic kiddie pool underneath her. Although I couldn't see into the pool from my angle on the floor, I knew it contained her blood and various body parts. I could tell it wasn't Emma. This woman had dirty blonde hair, not auburn hair, but it was little solace in the face of such disturbing cruelty. Just stand up, Hester said. Forget about her, Brett said. Help me get Rick up. He could come around any moment. Just stand up, I could no longer stand it. They sounded far enough away that I had to risk it. I had to turn my head. Both Hester and Brett stood near a workbench near the door we'd come through. Hester was trying to get the half-conscious woman to stand on her own, but it wasn't working out. And he was getting madder with each passing second. Come on, he said, slapping her face. I know you can hear me, you Their backs were to me. I moved slowly, sitting up while keeping my eyes fixed on them, hoping they wouldn't turn around. Stand up! Come on, Hess. Just let her fall if she's gonna fall. I know she can hear me, Hester said, reaching for a screwdriver on a pegboard above the workbench. He placed the tip of the screwdriver under her right eye. Open your eyes, I got into a crouch, glancing around for anything to use as a weapon. There was nothing close. Everything was on the workbench at the wall. I could see the pistol in the small of Brett's back, shoved into his waistband. Open your eyes! The woman's eyelids fluttered open and seemed to focus on Hester. That's good, he said, just before jamming the screwdriver into the woman's eye socket. She screamed, arms flailing as Hester shoved the tool deeper into her skull. The noise from her lungs was no match for the thumping bass and discordant treble from next door. Her scream faded and her arms went limp as she twitched, her other eye rolling up into her head. God damn, Brett said, voice giddy with excitement. Even from behind, I could see that he was pawing at his crotch. Let me have her while she's still warm, he said. I had been frozen in terror during this whole interaction, still crouching. 
I wanted to scream and vomit all at once. But the next words Hester spoke brought me back to myself. No, we need to get Rick secured first. As he said this, he threw a casual glance over his shoulder. Our eyes met. I like to think that my eyes were full of hate and determination, just like his. But I don't think they were. The only thing in my eyes was fear. Brett! Hester screamed, finally dropping the poor woman to the ground while keeping hold of the screwdriver. As Brett turned to look, I jumped from my crouch, lunging forward the two men as fast and hard as I could. Brett got the gun out of his back waistband just a moment before I reached him. I grabbed the gun with both hands as I crashed into him, pointing the weapon toward the ceiling. He smashed back first into the workbench as we fought for the gun. I lost Hester from my peripheral vision, only to realize where he was as he plunged the screwdriver into my lower back. Shouting, I jerked an elbow back, hitting nothing but air. Hester was too quick. He pulled the tool out and jammed it into a different spot in my lower back. The pain was too much. I was struggling to keep Brett from pointing the gun at me, and I didn't have much more left in the tank. Hester wrapped an arm around my neck from behind, his other hand jostling the screwdriver still inside me. I felt his breath on my ear as he got close. How's that feel? He said. That's what I'm gonna do to your sister as soon as I'm done with you. The gun was coming down. Brett was still fighting for it, rage all over his face. I let it come. But there's one difference, Hester said. Brett and I are gonna f*** the wounds while she's still alive. He <laughs> laughed in my ear, breath smelling of beer and cigarettes. I wanted to collapse, but I didn't. I let the gun come down until it was pointing at the space in the hollow of my shoulder, between chest and arm. F*** you, I said, and I pushed Brett's trigger finger down. The gun fired, the bullet blasting through my shoulder and into Hester. He fell back, grunting in pain. With a little bit of strength I had left, I shoved the gun back out of the way with one hand and reached around my back with the other, pulling the screwdriver out. I jammed the tool into Brett's neck. It went in the right side of his throat and poked out the left. His eyes went wide in his damaged face. He let go of the gun and stumbled away, tripping over the woman's body as he panicked, trying and failing to keep the blood in his body with his hands. I tried to hang onto the gun with my left hand, but that arm didn't want to work anymore. I let it clatter to the floor. The pain was coming on now, and I knew I would pass out soon. I turned around to see Hester scrambling along the ground, a bullet hole in his upper chest, but it didn't look like much more than a flesh wound. By the time the bullet had gone through me, it had lost most of its stopping power, but it had done enough. I kicked him in the head once, and he stopped squirming so much, which allowed me to straddle him. I put the tip of the screwdriver just under his eye. Where's my sister? I asked, pushing the tip just enough so that if he moved, it would do some serious damage. In the back office, he said, voice high. She's alive, okay? She's alive. That's good, I said and jammed the screwdriver into his eye as far as it would go. I found Emma in the back office, locked in a metal cage meant for dogs. She was alive, although she'd taken a beating. Soon after I retrieved the keys for the lock from Hester's pocket, I collapsed. I don't remember much of anything after that. I woke up in the hospital, Emma at my side. It was two days later. How are you feeling? I asked her. Me? I feel like she said, but it's nothing compared to how I'm sure you feel. You haven't dosed? Emma shook her head and smiled. But you have. You're doped to the gills. I smiled back. It was true. I've quit once, I said. I can do it again, but I'm gonna need your help. Emma reached out and took my hand. You got it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.